This is a KSPS PBS election special. A debate featuring candidates for Spokane City Council President. Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Christy Gorenson. KSPS is pleased to bring you this debate featuring the candidates running for Spokane City Council President. The council president is elected by a citywide vote, gets one vote on the seven person council and sets the agenda for and presides over the body's meetings. They also communicate with the mayor's office and city departments, help set the council's priorities and participate in active debates over ordinances and policies that steer city government. It is a big job. Let me introduce the job seekers to you. Betsy Wilkerson currently serves on the City Council representing District 2. She is also owner of Moore's Assisted Living Center. Kim Pleece is the former owner of Police Printing and Marketing. Last year she ran for Spokane County Commission seat. Welcome to you both. Thank you. For the debate, the candidates will answer questions from two Spokane journalists, Nate Sanford of the Inlander and Brandon Hollingsworth with Spokane Public Radio. Candidates will have one minute for answers. They are allowed two rebuttals limited to 30 seconds each. So let's begin. Kim will take the first question and that will come from Brandon. Thank you, Christy, and thank you both for being here and speaking with us today. I wanted to begin with a current going concern for the mayor's office and the city council, city government in general, which is the budget deficit. Uh, at least $20 million going into 24. Different estimates have come up with even some higher figures than that. What is the city council president's role in helping shape and solve the budget deficit that city is facing? Well, the mayor d puts the budget together and the city council basically approves it and they, you know, go back and forth. The city council president is a leader of the city council and can make suggestions, go back and forth with the mayor of where to cut and where um, uh, to, you know, spend money. The, my priority in this for the city is public safety. So that is one area well, I will not cut. But what we need to do is the, the mayor's uh, budget right now is basically priority based. And so again, public safety is number one. But it's also like freeze hiring, um, things like that, which I agree with. Um, he, there are some tax increases, which, you know, I, as a, as a tax paying citizen, it's really hard to keep continuing to pay taxes, which is understandable. So I am a solutions provider. So what I would do is look and see how we can grow um, our businesses, um, develop housing, which generates tax income that will help Thank us you. Your time in the future. Up. Thank you. Betsy. Thank you and thank you for having me. So, yes, the council, that's one of their primary duties. We legislate and we are the financial arm of the city. The mayor does submit a budget to us. Council drives that with its priorities. We do have a budget director in our office that has been helping us ring the bell for two years that we have a structural deficit. So we look at the priorities. We look at open vacancies in the city maybe those won't be filled. We are looking at, yes, revenue increase because our revenue is not keeping up with our expenses. That is council's job. So other things we're looking at in the city, we have not looked at all of our fee structure for over 10 years. So we've been on autopilot, not looking at, are we really charging the real cost of services that are being delivered? And I talk about an increase in compensation because our employees deserve that. So it is the council's primary rule and responsibility is to oversee the budget and that will be approved by us. Thank you, Betsy. You'll take this next question from Nate. Yeah, thank you both uh, so much for being here. Um, this question is specifically directed to, um, to Betsy. Um, and I wanted to ask about the city's um, Trent Resource and Assistance Center, which is the 350-bed uh, homeless shelter that's operated by the city. Um, it's been more than a year since the shelter opened, but it still lacks indoor bathrooms. Um, and in May, city council approved funding to install bathrooms at the shelter, but those plans seem to have stalled. And now winter is coming, and people staying there are still using outdoor porta potties which are unreliable and have you know, some, some issues there. Um, why does the shelter still lack indoor bathrooms? Whose responsibility was it to make that happen? So when the facility opened last year, I just want to make it clear, 
the administration never gave us any options to housing for homeless. It was to track or nothing. We did approve the funding for that, and this is the structural, how our government set up. We funded that. That got sent to the administration to send out the request for proposals for that work to be done. They said it was stalled, and then the conversation around the regional approach came up. So we start looking at, are we going to invest in a building that we don't own, almost $2 million? Will the regional homeless uh, coalition pick that up? So it stalled for two reasons. Administration didn't execute, and then the conversations of where do we go next? Because we know we cannot continue to fund that center, and currently in the budget is only funded through next June. So even if we put in bathrooms, we would not have return on our investment. Kim, you can have a minute to respond if you'd like. Well, I just want to remind uh, everyone that uh, my opponent is uh, the Finance and Administration, head of the Finance and Administration Committee. And the City Council majority um, kept putting off approving the shelter. It was an idea that the mayor put in place. And, you know, frankly, um, winter is coming right now. And, the, you know, there's, we really need to have that shelter. They, they'll, they'll have a roof over their head. And uh, I know that people have said it's not homey enough and there's porta potties, but it's better than the situation that they had at Camp Hope, which was, you know, out in the elements, not safe. Um, so, uh, and I know it is not a, a sustainable um, uh, facility um, as far as tax dollars go. And, uh, we, you know, I want um, our city to belong and join the uh, homeless authority that they have, Rick Romero and a few people have put together. Betsy. So when the track shelter was sent to us, we kept asking, what is the total cost of the track shelter? And the administration could never give us anything definitive. So we were being fiscally responsible. The numbers kept changing. They didn't have the contracts in place. Then another provider was brought on in the middle of the contract. We have to be responsible to the citizens as well and be fiscally responsible for that. So to say that um, it was council's fault, it's not accurate. And yes, we want them to have a place to stay during the winter, which is why we have committed to funding it at least through June. Let's move on to the next question. Kim, you'll take this one from Brandon. We mentioned the Regional Homelessness Coalition in the most recent round of answers there. So I would like to focus on that for just a moment because that's obviously a going concern, not just for Spokane, but other municipalities in the county. Uh, this is the next great conversation around homelessness in the Spokane region. Can you give me your strongest argument in favor of the Regional Homelessness Approach and your greatest concern for it? Well, the biggest, um, strongest point that I agree with joining uh, the Homeless Authority is getting all the people that um, deal with homeless, that know, you know, uh, how I've worked and, you know, the city funds so many different organizations when it comes to the homeless about, you know, pooling all the, the experts together and um, figuring out, you know, the best way that we can get people out of, you know, the homeless situation, whether it's, you know, crisis intervention, you know, housing, um, uh, you know, drug addiction, you know, things like that. Um, I did meet with Rick Romero, one of the, the three individuals that put together the plan for the Homeless Authority. Um, and uh, the only um, setback right now is we, we don't know the cost of what it would take to put it together. So they're working on that and I'm excited to hear you know, the plan. All right, thank you, Betsy. Absolutely in support of a regional approach. I have said many times before, homeless people do not know the boundaries of the cities. You can be in Spokane one minute and in the valley the next. And Spokane is the central hub. So this whole collaboration is an exciting venture for us. We have many more things we need to do a regional collaboration on and bringing the providers in. The biggest challenge is the cost. Currently, Spokane shares a disproportionate burden on providing services to our homeless and unhoused people. We will contribute the 
biggest chunk of money toward this organization. So yes, we want to have another seat at the table. We want to have more input on how it's going to be operated because we want the best outcomes for our citizens as well. So going forward, working with our providers who have really not been engaged is going to be the opportunity and the challenge. Uh, Kim, you'll take this next question from Nate. Um, and it's, it's about the track shelter again. Um, l last week, you suggested that the, um, the city could perhaps do cutbacks and um, consider serving only two meals a day at the shelter instead of three. Um, I just kind of wanted to get a bit more detail on kind of that and what you um, would hope to accomplish with that. And then if there are any other cutbacks at the shelter that you would want to consider? Well, um, that was just a, you know, a suggestion. And I did get a lot of comments about that and said, you know, that's not going to do much to cut back. Uh, and I think that the Salvation Army and the people that are serving at that uh, facility, you know, they're doing the best that they can. Well, and it's a low barrier shelter. And I've heard that they, you know, the people that are in the shelter are still doing drugs in the shelter. And I think that there needs to be accountability and not have them um, be able to do drugs. Uh, it, there are 350 people there. There needs to be more accountability, like how are we helping these people get out of homelessness, getting them connected with family, uh, you know, whatever it takes. So this was only supposed to be a temporary solution. And it, it, there's still 350 people a night in that shelter. So, that's it. Yes, it was supposed to only be a temporary solution. The administration has not brought forward any other plans or opportunities for anything different. We talk about accountability. There is accountability required of the people who are there, and there's accountability for the provider who is running those services. I think the provider is doing great, but you have 300 people in a warehouse, which is larger than some of our small towns with no government structure. They come in, they sleep, and they eat. I was disappointed to hear my opponent talk about two meals a day because when you don't have anything else, you look forward to the next meal. It's how it breaks your day up. We're not trying to make it comfortable, but we do want it to be a humane place to be if you have nowhere else to be. Can I rebut on that? You may. Well, again, bringing up Camp Hope, um, which I personally think was an absolute disaster. Over $24 million was spent on Camp Hope to get those, you know, anywhere from 200 to 600 people out of homelessness. And out of that whole, all that money that was spent, only nine people were permanently housed. You know, they lost track of 223 people uh, that they couldn't account for. So, you know, the trend shelter is really something temporary. I think right now, because winter's coming, we can't cut back in any way, shape, or form. We just need to figure out ways of getting the homeless authority and getting all the, you know, the people that are involved uh, in the homeless um, uh, services here in Spokane to get together and figure out a better solution. Absolutely. Camp Hope should have never happened. However, if we had not gotten money from the state, because the city certainly didn't have those types of resources to invest in relocating the homeless people to where they are right now, they would still be there. And I have to question where Ms. Please is getting her data on the numbers that were served, housed, because we have not gotten consistent data either. So. I just want to make sure if we're going to quote data, let's quote the correct data. Uh, Kim, you'll take this next question from Brandon. All right. I want to talk about public safety here and specifically what the city council's relationship to Spokane's police department should or ought to look like. Uh, the two of you over the course of the primary season earlier this year framed it very differently. Um, as Wilkerson has pointed out, budget requests have been granted. The city police department is being funded. Uh, there are unfilled positions, but that those have been funded. They are, they are there waiting to be filled, but there are systemic issues across the country in filling law enforcement jobs right now. And as police, you have talked about how there's more to the formula, you think, than that, that there's something missing in terms of rhetoric and, and a sort of a, an attitude issue. And I wanted to give you the opportunity to explain again uh, what you think ideally the council's relationship looks like with the police department. 
Well, I, I, I really truly believe in my opponent's actions and the city council needs to be doing a better job supporting our police department than they're doing right now. Um, you know, my opponent protested a police precinct in our own district that they clearly wanted. Um, you know, she was invited to when it opened and she outwardly protested that. Um, she also, um, you know, recently there's an email where her and our current temporary city council president were, you know, making fun of our police department. I did a six hour ride along with a lieutenant in the police department and they f told me flat out that they don't feel like they're supported. They have a huge recruitment issue and when the city council really um, is out there saying that by their actions that they don't support uh, the police department. It's really hard to get officers to come to Spokane and, um, and you know, we're short 100 officers right now. And, you know, crime is skyrocketing in our town. I would like to, you Kim, know, your, what... Kim, your time is up. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Betsy? My, uh, Miss, please continue to say that council does not support the police and that there is this perception that the laws we have made, the ordinances, is anti-police. We support the police, but we also have a whole community that we have to engage with and represent. I, again, challenged the numbers. Last night, Ms. Plea said 100 vacancies, and the mayor said 70 vacancies. Inconsistent information. That's what council's been receiving. Also, with the approval of a new contract, that has helped. Last Friday, the chief says recruitment is up higher than it has been, especially with laterals who can hit the ground running. So there was a financial component to make coming to Spokane more attractive because we were not competitive. But this rhetoric that council does not support as police really has to stop. It's divisive and it's not true. I would like to. Um, well, there's one thing with when your back's against the wall right before election season, you approve a police contract and actually supporting them. Those are two very different things. It really is. That's All right. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Betsy, you'll take this one first from Nate. Uh, yeah, I wanted to um, follow up on public safety. Um, the Spokane Police Department is the, um, the most well-funded department in the city. Um, do you think that their current um, funding levels are sufficient? What, just like generally, what percentage of the city's general fund should go towards the police department? That's a difficult question to answer because we're looking at just the outward facing officers, but there's also all the people who are behind the scenes that are making the police department work. I can tell you we increased their budget 22% last year to meet the needs of the citizens of Spokane for buy ahead cars, which was a issue that we had no control over, funded uh, positions that have not been filled, funded necessary equipment so they would be safe on their job, funded the academy so it had better state of the art training facilities for our officers. Currently, I don't want to misquote, but I believe police is almost at 38% of the budget, or possibly a little higher. All right, thank you, Kim. Uh, well, a few years ago, uh, our city council voted by Teslas uh, for the police department over the objections, I believe, of the police department. And they're really not effective. We don't have the infrastructure to have uh, electric cars. Um, I've heard from the police department that they, the officers with all their gear and, and things like that can't even fit in the cars to drive. So, you know, uh, uh, another way that um, our city council majority have really um, has not used um, money well in that regard. All right. Just want to let you both know that you have both used your 30 second okay. uh, rebuttals uh, as we continue forward. So, uh, you. Kim, you'll take this next question from Brandon. Uh, before I ask my question question, I want to follow up on Nate's. He sure. asked, what percentage of the general fund should go to the police department? Five seconds or less, Ms. Police. Well, um, personally, the most important thing, and, I, and not personally, but our entire community believes public safety is number one. So I would say 
uh, you know, whatever is budgeted right now, personally, I, I think is not enough um, because crime is up, with shootings. I mean, you, you hear on the news every single day about, um, you know, uh, uh, shootings in our park and, you know, a woman was assaulted in Riverfront Park a few days ago. Um, and I think that it, it's important. I just, you know, whatever it takes to make our, our, um, our city safe is extremely important, so. And Ms. Wilkerson, is it, right. should it be higher or lower? I, current funding levels, it's like I said, it's running about 38% in the budget. If we have to maintain that, to maintain our level of service, that does come at a cost to other services that the city provides to our other residents, whether that's fire, whether that's our people who pick up our garbage, street sweepers, snow removal, all the clerks behind the scenes, there is a give and take in that. So there has to be a balance and that is what city council has to decide. And then my question uh, shift us into kind of a similar direction but with a different department, the mayor's office. This is another area of disagreement between the two of you. What is the council's role ideally in its relationship with the executive branch, with the mayor's office. And Ms. Police, you take the first one. Well, there needs to be more collaboration between the city council president and the mayor. And I see, you know, you read in the news almost every single day of an argument that they're, you know, not getting along. I mean, recently they formally uh, did a censure, um, which personally was, I've heard this from a lot of people as well, a complete waste of time, taxpayers' time and things like that, to put her in front of, um, you know, the city council and, and um, make her look bad. I, I think that they, there needs to be a lot more collaboration. And I would, I would ask my opponent, why aren't you doing more to work together for the betterment of the people that we serve, that they serve? So... I, and I know I will do a much better job at that, um, collaborating, whoever wins um, the race. Betsy? The way our government is structured, there is the administrative and the legislative branch. We will not always agree. Collaboration is always the goal. However, collaboration is a two-way street. The administration currently has not included council in on a lot of their decisions or a lot of things they have not executed on. So if you don't have the best information or you're not invited in to the decision-making process, that is a failure of communication. Always it could be better. And like I said, really what we're talking about is not about individual people. It's not about the mayor. It's about the office. It's not about the council president. It's about the council office and really what is best for the citizens of Spokane and how can we make the most impact? All right, thank you. Betsy, you'll take this next question from Nate. Uh, yeah, I wanted to um, keep asking about the, uh, the role of the mayor. Um, um, the, uh, the mayor's race this year is you know, casting a pretty big shadow over the city council races. Um, you know, Betsy, you've been campaigning with Lisa Brown. Uh, you're clearly a supporter of hers. Kim, you've been campaigning with um, Mayor Woodward. Um, so I was curious, I, I wanted to ask you both, um, starting with Betsy, is, are there any issues where you and um, Lisa Brown disagree? We um, do, we do. So first of all, we will not agree on everything just because we have alignment of some similar ideas in how we want to move forward. One area we don't agree on is our sustainability action plan uh, that is made up of experts and citizens. She's talking about how we can move that faster. We're looking at what is the process and the funding to do that. That is one area. We have some disagreements also around some public safety issues, how we want to address those. So again, we are not a rubber stamp. We will disagree. Disagreement can be healthy for our community to really come up with the best solutions. And then for, for Kim, uh, are there any areas where you and Mayor Woodward um, disagree? Oh, I'm sure. We, I, we've disagreed on a few areas of spending and things like that. And, uh, but I, I know that we can work together. Um, I think that the, the issues that I've had in the past of the city council and the mayor, it just seems like it's so pub public. It's, it's always about you know, who's right in the situation. And I know that I'll do a, a much better job communicating. I mean, that, that was uh, you know, my business, communication and marketing and you know, working together. I've been a leader in this community for years. 
uh, and, uh, and you know, I, I believe that I'll do a much better job whoever gets elected. Kim, in, your, in advertisements and on the campaign trail, you've um, noted that, you know, cr crime is increasing, homelessness is increasing, um, you know, there are drug use in parks. Um, does, does any of that criticism extend to the current administration um, who's been in power for the past four years, or does that, uh, does that responsibility fall on city council? Well, I think it, it partially, yes, falls on, because that's one of our, our jobs is, you know, keeping the peace and public safety. So it really does fall on, you know, the city council the, yeah, and the city council president. So I think that they could have done a lot, you know, better job. And again, it's about, you know, the narrative, you know, coming up with a better community policing method. Uh, and um, it's, it's really worrisome because crime in our city um, affects every part of our community. It affects tourism, Kim, your, your time housing. is up, I'm sorry. Oh, oh no and we're, we're running short on time. Mm -hmm. So Betsy, if you would like 30 I, seconds. I would like to respond to that. So once again, council does not supervise the police department. That is the administration's role. We have funded them. How they execute, that is in the mayor's purview. Staffing is an issue, but once again, to blame council for everything that has gone wrong with this city really is just not true. We have continued to provide what was asked of us to help them achieve their outcomes. All right, well, that will be the last question. Time now for closing statements, and Kim, you'll go first. Oh, great. Um, the choice is clear in, in this election. I believe that I will be an effective city council president, not a political one. I intend to get things done, just as I had to do with my, in my business. I took care of my clients, my employees, my family, and my community. I am embedded in this community. I will take that same experience and apply it to, um, to be your next city council president. The public's interest will be front and center. I won't play the political games that have negatively impacted our city. I will get down to business. Um, I am for making Spokane a healthy city for businesses and families. I'm for protecting our downtown, our parks and our neighborhood. I will be transparent. I will be accountable. We can't afford to uh, move any slower on issues of public safety, homelessness, and housing. The voter's choice is crystal clear. I'm Kim Please, and I would appreciate your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Betsy? Thank you again for having me. Yes, the choice is crystal clear. I am an experienced leader that listens, a leader who knows the job. Council over these last three years has set up the Sustainability Action Plan, which is required by state. We set up the Housing Action Plan. We set up a traffic plan. Council has come up with the plans that have not come out of the administration side. A leader who knows the community deeply embedded for years, because I can find solutions that works for everyone. And I show up. Spokane has asked I show up. And I have ran a positive campaign that was my commitment to the voters when I started. I'm a leader who loves the city. I want to see Spokane, like we all do, be a safe, healthy, and vibrant city for generations to come. I'd be honored to have your vote. Well, that will do it for this debate. Our thanks to each of the candidates. Thank you, as well as to reporters Nate Sanford and Brandon Hollingsworth. For all of us at KSPF, thank you for watching.